there, welcome to Church in Ramona, and thank you so much for spending your time here with us as we gather to encounter God. My name's Jami, and I'm here to share some important information about the service before we start. If you're new here, we want to welcome you into our family. For us, church is so much more than just a Sunday service. It is about the assembling with the body of Christ. We want you to leave this building forever changed. We would love to get to know you better, and one of the best ways you can do that is to fill out our Get Connected cards, either here at church or on our website. If you have kids, we want to let you know that we have services for them too. If they're under the age of five, we have our Little Fishers team that takes care of them throughout the entire service. And for the five to 12 year olds, we have our Hearts of Faith and World Changers classes that happen after worship service. We invite you to come on in early and say hi before service, or stay after in fellowship with everybody else. Our coffee bar, Holy Grounds, is available 30 minutes before and after service, providing you with some hot and cold coffees and some yummy snacks. We have a variety of ways you can give your tithes and offerings. After worship service, you will have the opportunity to give in-house, and for those online, you can give on the mobile app or on the website. With all that being said, we're gonna kick things off in here in just a minute. Find your seats if you haven't already, and let's get ready to worship God together. Does everyone like the Jami video? Yeah. Yeah. Stop, she says. It's the service info video, but we just call it the Jami video. We're going to just relabel it. <clears throat> How many of y'all glad to be here? Yeah. Man, every opportunity to assemble is a wonderful one, isn't it? Every day is a wonderful day because we're alive still. Amen. We've been given the gift of another day, another life, another opportunity to repair relationships, to grow closer to God. It's Every day is a blessing. Amen? So we're going to spend some time this morning, obviously, going through some worship and praise. And I just wanted to briefly remind you all the purpose of it. It's not just, oh, great tunes, or oh, the band was good with that song, or oh, they're playing my favorite song. The point is it's supposed to be preparing your hearts. The song is supposed to till your heart, break up the ground, so that when the word comes, it has a nice place to rest and grow and get rooted, and then it bears fruit in your life. Amen? Amen. So when you, when you sing that way, when you look at these words, it sometimes will convict you, but that's a good thing. Recognize the conviction and press into it and repent and say, God, that's me. It may uplift you. It may remove distractions of after the service, because that's not what we're focused on. Amen? We're not worried about what happens after this. After this isn't important. Right now is important. Being present with God. Amen? Bible says where two or more are gathered, he'll be there. Treat it like he's here in the room because he is. Acknowledge that he's here in the room and you can leave changed. Amen? All right.
Come on, just declare it out. you, Jesus. We acknowledge that you're here. We acknowledge that you are great and mighty and worthy to be praised, that anything you want to happen can happen, Lord. We just have to surrender it to you. Just go before us, Lord, and prepare our hearts.
peace like a river wash over me. Immerse me in water as deep as the sea. Hide me in your love, your healing embrace. Peace like a river, wash over me. As I worship your majesty, I worship your holy name, Jesus my every.
I hear thunder in the desert, a gathering cloud. Heaven stirring up our witness as your spirit pours out. These are the days that we've been waiting for, for all of our lives. A new beginning's riding on the storm. God, open our eyes. Cause when the rain comes crashing through our brain. I hear shouts of joy returning for every tear that we've sown. All the dreams we thought we buried will reap a heavenly foe. These are the days that we've been praying for when all is restored. The sky is heavy and this thirsty ground is ready for more. are the days that we've been waiting for, for all of our lives. A new beginning's riding on the storm. God, open our eyes. These are the days that we've been praying for. Come on, body, when all is restored. The skies are heavy and this thirsty ground. Hallelujah. 
As we were singing that song, the last two songs especially, hello, um, I believe Kev has a word. The scripture says for a time when you ought to. I'm looking at who's here today and I'm thinking, okay, this is, this is good. Uh, for a time when you ought to. How many of God expects you at a certain point in your life for you to be somewhere? How many of your parents, you expect your children at a certain place to be potty trained? If your kid's 15 and he's not potty trained, you failed. Or he's severely lazy. Uh, come on, guys, take up the offering while we do this real quick. Um, so today when you hear this message, sometimes we do it to ourselves. Because that song was talking about revival and it's talking about, Lord, we've seen you do it, do it again. In the 70s, I went out in the woods one night to go camping with some friends. I did not go out to get saved. But the Lord showed up that night and, he, and I had an encounter with him. You know what he did? He just showed me my life. He just said, this is what I see. Do you know how easy it is for God to put the mirror in your face. Everything you post, everything, this imaginary world, this life you have out in that everybody, that you let everybody else see, but you live with you. See, to thine own self be true. You got to quit. When you quit lying to yourself, then you can have real changes and real encounters. And that night, June 15, 1973, I went out and got by myself and I wasn't going to get saved. I was partying with my friends, and then I went off and got by myself, and the Lord did that. He just said, Mike, this is what I see. Now, you go, is this scriptural? Yes. Was there a guy named Saul on a mission? What was his mission? To go persecute God's people. I mean, that's not a good mission. What's your mission statement? I persecute God's people. Oh, <laughs> I'm not joining your ministry. He was out to persecute God's people. What happened to him? He had an encounter. The Lord said, Saul, Saul. He knocked him off his donkey, people. And he said, who is this? He said, it's Jesus whom you persecute. See, he had an encounter. I am praying today, and I wanted to say this before he started. I'm praying today that when Kevin shares this word, that you have an encounter with the words some of y'all, for a time when you ought to, you're still where you were years ago, and you shouldn't be there right now. There are things in your life that have, should have been gone by now. They should, not, the, they should not even be a thought. This should be way gone. And the fact that you're still wrestling with it and dealing with it, you're not letting, you're one encounter away from the Lord just having his way. You know, my life's been marked with some pretty cool adventures. I've had some pretty amazing adventures with the Lord. But I want to tell you why. And I've had young people in this church try to go out and do the things that I said I did so they could have the encounters I had. But it, it didn't work with them. You don't do it to try to have visions and things like that. It, it's of the heart. When I got saved... Two weeks after I got saved, I found myself at a place just kind of where I'd been before in a room full of people and just getting buzzed. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, why would you ever call on me? And I said, because I was tired. He said, of what? And I said, this. See, some of y'all, you should be tired. I don't understand why you're not tired of it yet. And that night I said, okay. He said, this is what he said to me. I don't know how God talked to you, but he said, he said, you give me drugs and I'll give you joy. That's a good trade, I'm telling you. It's, joy is way better than. So I went home and I got rid of everything that I was doing. And the next day I woke up with joy that's lasted for 50, 50 years. And see, I want to tell you, if you want those kind of encounters where you give God yuck and he gives you, you give him a dirt clod and then he gives you back a gold nugget. Not a dirt clod spray painted gold. It's, you still smell the paint. It's real. If you want real things in God, then you got to get real with this. 
Now, today's a time where you can get real with the Word, because I've, I've, I've looked at his notes this morning. <laughs> You're in for a roller coaster ride. But uh, we love Kev, right? Because he's not one to get up here and tell us all the things we want to hear. Not like me. You know, I'm Mr. Politically Correct, just sugarcoat it, make it so palatable. Yeah, not. This apple has not fallen far from the tree. So proud of him. So we're going to have, I just want you to prepare your heart. That This is what you say, Lord, be it unto me. If he says anything today, the Holy Spirit could have that encounter with me, could show if that's me, then I want, I want to deal with it. Did you want to dedicate him today? Yeah? Come, huh? Are you fixing to feed him or something? Well, you want to do it? You want, can, can he hold off a, you know, a minute? Yeah, come on, bring him down here. We've been itching to, yeah. We've been, we've only seen this guy. He's only been out a couple of weeks. We don't, we don't water baptize babies because that's not scriptural. And uh, it kind of makes them mad when you throw water on them. They don't really like it. But um, we do dedicate. Remember Hannah in the Bible? She said, Lord, if you give me a child, I'll dedicate him. So we believe that's scriptural. So we dedicate. And really, little man's not even know anything that's going on. He don't even know he came downstairs. If he knew I just robbed him of a feeding, he would probably... <laughs> He was like, you know, what, where are we going? Huh? Bring him on down. All right, Kev. Here we go. He is so pretty. Of course, I knew he was going to be a cutie because look at the gene pool. <laughs> Dad's handsome. Mom's beautiful. Oh, my goodness. He, look at this. He's been on the planet two weeks. He's got more hair than me. Come on. This is, <laughs> hey, buddy. <laughs> oh man, he is wide awake and <laughs> <laughs> the right. body wants to We see. have cordless mics. We can come down here. I I like it when they're sleeping, but this is okay. Hey, hey little man. Get get to know these two voices here cuz these are voices of significance. <laughs> okay. What's his name again? Azrael. It's like Israel, but with an A, huh? Yeah. All right. Father, we just lay hands on this couple, and we thank you for the wisdom of God beyond their years. Lord, I pray that Jesus has just an endowment today of wisdom from above. God, that you give him wisdom to, because this couple just became a family. Mm -hmm. It was just two, now it's three. So, Lord, I just ask that you give Give my brother just the wisdom of God to raise this son in the things of God, that he would grow up in a family of, of peace, Yes. that peace would be the earmark of his home. He would not know what strife is mm -hmm. because of the joy and the peace of God that's in this home yes. and the way that this man loves his wife. This will be Israel's uh, understanding of how to treat women, the way that you treat your wife. Mm -hmm. So, Lord, I just bless him. And, Lord, I pray that, Dan that Danny just have more I know that the, the first one's always like, oh, am I doing this right? Am I doing that right? <laughs> Lord, give her such, such confidence, yes. supernatural, Holy Spirit confidence in motherhood because it's already there. Motherhood is, is, is an endowment by God that he gave you. When yeah. the little man came out, wisdom poured in, and you are well able to raise this son in the things of God and to be to nurturing and loving. That's a key word, nurturing. Yes. Make sure this little man's heart that never lacks the nurturing of the Lord, that he is, he is so confident and so tender toward people because of the, of the tenderness that's in mamas. Mm. And, Lord, I pray he's bold as a lion, and he's, he's confident in, his, in, being, in being in masculine. That's such a weird word for people today. They think it's, it's offensive and it's wrong, but God... You made us to be masculine, made us as men to be strong and to be confident. So, Lord, I thank you, little man's going to have everything he needs to be complete and whole and to bring you glory 
to bring this this child is going to bring glory to this family and we just speak it over him right now i pray he's a sign and a wonder to everybody gets around and i just thank you lord we dedicate little man to you today for your kingdom for the glory of god in jesus name amen amen, amen. Oh. and he smiles it's like amen all right go feed that little fella all right we're gonna listen right this word is for come on say it out loud me me <laughs> oh all right that's quite an intro little ones can go on over to sunday school All kinds of snacks, spiritual snacks. They're teaching about fasting today. We'll see how long that lasts. <laughs> I don't think those kids are going to want to learn about fasting. I remember early in my early years when I was teaching Sunday school, I was teaching them about Abraham, actually, which I'm going to talk about later. And uh, we built small altars out of pretzels and put gummy bears on them. And I'm sure everyone that walked by the window was like, what is this man preaching? <laughs> All these kids are these little altars with gummy bears on them. Um, it was spiritual. They got it, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> oh, I am, it's, it's different for me this Sunday than some Sundays. Some Sundays it's a, it's, uh, a heavy revy. Some Sundays it's, uh, and for, that, for those you don't know, that's the hip word for heavy revelation. Um, it smacks. Um, slaps, whatever the kids say these days. <laughs> it's violent, apparently. Um, <laughs> no, but, and then sometimes it's the teacher. Sometimes it's the Greek and the Hebrew and the historical context, which I think is all important because I feel like sometimes we don't understand the word of God because we look at it. And we just assumed the words on the page were selected for whatever reason, and the English language is terrible, and there can be four or five Greek words for one English word. And then you could misinterpret the entire Bible by doing that. Um, but today is a little different. Today, um, the Lord pressed on me why— uh, I'm hoping today you'll walk away with the answer of, I know why my walk is harder than it should be, because it shouldn't be hard. It really shouldn't. It should not be hard. And I know you're already thinking, you know, whatever, Margaret. I don't know if there's a Margaret in the house, but somebody's thinking, well, you know, the Bible says you're going to have tribulation. That's true. The Bible does say you have tribulation. But we're going to talk about what real tribulation is. And I guarantee you it's not the line at Starbucks. It's not SDG&E, right? It's not, it, it's not, it might not even be the loss of your job because some of those things are choices and self-inflicted. And it's because you're choosing to go back you're choosing to go return to the place that you already left and so this message is entitled why go back to egypt there's nothing there for you why go back to egypt um but your walk is supposed to be easy let's start matthew let's go chapter 11 and we'll do verse 28 through 30 so you, they're going to put it up there so you don't feel the need to change just write it and you know read it up there uh, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So tell me, what part of that scripture makes you think that this is supposed to be hard? There's no part of that scripture that's like, and you'll have turmoil and suffer all of this loss and all these type of things. See, if we come to Christ done and we take off the yoke of bondage and we put on his yoke holy, then there is, there is nothing hard. The problem is you are trying to carry a double burden. You're still trying to maintain a yoke of bondage while also taking up the yoke of Christ and the two aren't going in the same place, and one is weighing you down, and you feel like God's not doing enough. And that's going to that's gonna be a trap of the enemy. Um, but I hear you. You're 
you know, you're going to have tribulation. You're right, going to have tribulation. Let's go to John chapter 16, out of Jesus' own mouth. John chapter 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. See, when we are in Christ, we have peace. But it said you'll have tribulation. Yeah, in the world, you'll have tribulation. But you know what? I can go through tribulation and not feel like it's tribulation. I can go through things that are very hard on my soul and not come out blaming, indicting God, questioning why is he doing this to me? Why is he allowing these things to happen in my life? Why? Because it says, be a good cheer. I've overcome the world. The word, the word tribulation is thalipsis, pressured through affliction, distressed in calamity and persecution, an exterior cause that does this, an exterior cause. I can't stand it when I hear Christians, people who say they have faith and believe in God, who say, oh, I'm in spiritual warfare, my finances, I'm in spiritual warfare. That might not be spiritual warfare. Nine times out of ten, it's not. It's just a lack of your own discipline. You're sowing poor stewardship, and you're reaping poor stewardship, and you're like, I'm in spiritual warfare. The, it, you're, you're using, I, I guarantee you that when, when, when the, the original apostles were getting their backs laid open, and they were really suffering tribulation and spiritual warfare, they look at your SDG&E bill and go, yeah, it's the same thing. Your high bill is absolutely the same thing as my present suffering. No. No. But see, pride and vanity makes us exalt the small things in our life. You ever heard the term first world problems? If you haven't heard them, it's ridiculous. It's like complaining about having only one Wi-Fi router. It's complaining about the fact that it takes longer than five seconds to load a web page. That's a first world problem. There are people who don't have running water, but you're going to complain because an app didn't load properly. This app's not working. Oh, my gosh, my life is terrible. See, we have a problem. I say, when I say we, I mean a society, Americans. We have a problem because we take all these petty little things and exalt them to be such great and terrible things as if those are the things that God intended for us to overcome. And he's sitting there saying, that's the filth I don't want you even focused on. That's the dung. That's the rubbish. That's the, car the carnal, fleshly, temporal things. That's not tribulation. That's supposed to be gone at the cross. Your eyes are supposed to be upward, not downward. Um, let's do that. Romans chapter 5. Ooh. Romans chapter 5. And we'll start at verse 5, but he talks about being justified by faith. And not only that, not only are we justified through the faith, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. Character, hope. And a hope, now hope, does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So when you go through those trials and you go through those tribulations and you wonder, God, why are you doing this? Well, you're just ignorant because it says right here why you go through it. Because of what it produces, right? When it's a real tribulation, when you are persecuted by your family for no other reason than the gospel, that's persecution, when you're persecuted because you were rude to somebody and they responded in a very carnal way, that's not persecution. You run up to someone and be disrespectful to them. They're disrespectful back and you go, oh, I've been persecuted for the name of Jesus. That wasn't Jesus going to them and it certainly wasn't persecution because of Jesus. And you're giving Jesus a bad name. <laughs> oh, to, the word glory means, to, means head held high boasting from a vantage point if you can't boast in tribulation you're looking at it wrong if you can't boast in the current things that you're going through then you have not got to the vantage point that god wants to get you to so you can see it for what it is 
That is a good word. That's a word for somebody right now. If you're not seeing your tribulation as it's going to work something good, and you can boast, boast in it. To be boastful, I mean, that's, that's a confidence. That's, that's like being down 50 to nothing and being like, yeah, we're going to win the game. You're down 50 to nothing, and there's two minutes left. We're going to win the game. Doesn't look like it. Doesn't have to look like it. Doesn't have to look like it. Is it in our strength? No. Is it in our, uh, our, our abilities? Is it in our time? No. So you can be confident that whatever trial, tribulation that you are going through, if you have the right vantage point, you can look at it and say, I'm confident. That's the scripture, I'm pressed down, right? I'm pressured and pressed down. I'm not destroyed, right? I'm not abandoned, right? That's what that scripture really means is because you can look at those things and say, yeah, it looks that way, but it's not. It looks that way because if I'm a rat in a maze, I'm looking at a bunch of walls and I have no idea where I am. If I get an advantage point, I can see the end goal and I know what God's trying to work in me and I have faith that he'll get me through. That's the power that we have through that faith, amen? So when I say your yoke is easy, burden's light, why is it hard? Well, there's some things we do to make it hard. And that's what I'm gonna go after today. What are the things that you're doing? Because if you ever look at someone's life and go, man, we talk about this all the time. Serving God is the easiest part of my life. The easiest part. And he makes everything else really easy too. So serving him has never been, uh, never got me into a position where I was like, oh man, this walk is so hard. I've been in places of pressure. I've been in Gethsemane. I've been in the place where I'm like, man, I feel like I'm pressed down. I feel like I'm all alone. I've felt that way. But what do we always say? Your feelings can be real, doesn't make them true. Feelings really exist, they're just not always truthful. Because you can look at a situation and say, I'm abandoned, but in reality, it's God saying, no, I'm working that character in you. You could look at the situation, I'm feeling pressured. No, I'm showing how great I can be on your behalf, right? Our feelings doesn't equal anything in the kingdom. Amen? So what are those things that we are doing that's making the walk harder? And let me tell you, the enemy already sets enough traps, right? He's got weights. He's got traps. He's got things that he tries to throw into your life to make it hard, right? So don't do it to yourself. Then you're doing his job, right? You don't need to do his job. He does it pretty darn well himself. Um, but I'll tell you, the one of the reasons why we, we tend to, to struggle in our walks is because we don't have eternity in our hearts. You want a vantage point? Focus on eternity. The Bible says that when you set that eternity in your heart, now all of these temporal things have no power over me. I don't even fear death. Why? Because I'm eternal. Now, what does that leave me with? Nothing. There's nothing the end. No weapon formed against me can prosper. Why? Because I'm an eternal being now. Through Jesus, I am eternal, and I don't have to worry about anything. Doesn't mean I won't go through them, but I'm forever, I'm in that vantage point where eternity is in my heart. And when you have that, then it doesn't matter what traps and things come before you you're, you're going to be unmoved. Now, just because you have eternity in your heart doesn't mean that people won't try to throw hooks and pull you down. Relationships pull you down. How many of y'all have had that friend that backbites or gossips or complains or murmurs or everything you say that's good, they feel like they have to counterbalance with bad, right? We don't need to be hitched to those type of things. And that may be a hard saying for some people, but I've said constantly, if you truly love this person, the Bible says there's a time to embrace, time to refrain from embracing. It says there's a time to love. It says there's also a time to hate. I know. Whoo, hate. Christians can't hate. Did a whole sermon on love not. And I know that's, that was a struggle for some of you to be like, but it feels like a curse word to say hate. But there are certain things that God says I hate this 
And you need to hate that too, the things of this world. Why? Because they keep your mind and your heart so focused on your, your, your little life and your, your, your little job and your little house and your little. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, where you're going to sleep, what you're going to wear, he said. Why? Because th I take care of animals that do none of those things. How much more am I going to do for you? If you would just focus on the eternal things, you'll have that vantage point where I promise you, no matter what situation you go, to, go through, it'll look like you're coasting. And people will come to you and be like, do you not know the gravity of the situation? No, I know the gravity of the situation. But I have a God who defies gravity. I'm, I'm well aware of what could take place, but I'm not going to walk down the path of what could happen when I've been promised of a surety what will happen. Amen? Okay. <coughs> kind of feel like it's ramping up. I don't know what God's going to do, but it's getting exciting up here. All right. And I know what's coming, and I'm still getting excited. All right. First thing that we can do that makes our walk harder. We get impatient. Impatient. And it's hard because we live in a world where Amazon Prime can deliver overnight at 4 o'clock in the morning something you ordered at 8 o'clock the night before. I know because I ordered pickleball paddles for some brothers. They were like, oh, man, we want to get some new paddles, and the sale was over. And I was like, sorry, Zach, sorry, Mark, I can't get you guys those paddles. And I looked on Amazon, they're like, we could be at your house at 4 a.m. Creepy, but okay. <laughs> you know, we live in, in such a world where faster means better, immediate gratification, which takes the longing out of things. And it's the longing of things that breeds appreciation and respect and reverence for the things we get. Saving myself for my marriage to my wife was worth it. It was worth it. Worth it. Because now the reverence I have for that time with her, the respect I have for that time with her, is so much more beautiful than if it's just flippant. Right? It's worth it. The longing teaches us to respect and love and cherish the thing that we finally get. But when we're impatient, when we think God needs our help, making something happen we will set things in front of us that trip us up and the enemy goes oh i didn't even put that speed bump but that was a doozy thank you because now i can set you back x amount of months x amount of years because of that one thing and i didn't even do it i didn't even have to do it I recently watched the movie Nefarious, and I was so pumped afterwards. I'm telling you what. It, it, was, it was not a like, oh, my gosh, everything could be a demon. It was very much a, our enemy takes this war so much more serious than, seriously than we do. Because they look at every opportunity. They go, we don't have opinions. We have knowledge. We know God exists. You guys debate whether he does or not. Right? They know there's a judgment coming. We try to pretend like everyone's going to just get through. Well, God is love, and he loves everybody, so everybody gets to go spend eternity with him. Right? They know we battle with our own thoughts and feelings and opinions on things that they already know. So every moment of every day, they are dedicated to destroying you. That's what they seek to do. Because it's very real to them. God created you. You are higher than them. You can be redeemed. You can make mistakes. They made one mistake who knows how long ago, and they can't be redeemed. You made mistakes this morning, and you're here holy and righteous before God. And that, that irks them to no end. They hate you, hate you, and want to destroy you. And so when we sit here and, and try to pretend like there's not these other influences, when the Bible says you battle not against flesh and blood, that's not the thing you're battling against. There are principalities and things that oppress and seek to destroy us. Every day they wake up and go, how can I make Danielle's life miserable? 
How can I make her forsake her God? Right? She just had a birthday. She's, she's walking on sunshine. But, happy birthday. But, that's what they do. That's what they do. And we wake up and we go, oh man, I probably should spend some time in the word. So lackadaisical. Do we not know there's a war going on? Like I said, there's times and seasons. We are in a season. We are in a season. If you're getting weary now, pray the Lord take you home because that's going to trample you. I'm serious. Because that will trample you. Because it doesn't say you've run with the footmen. How will you run with horses? It says contend with horses. If you run with footmen and you're tired, how are you going to stand against a horse charge? You need every ounce of strength in you to overcome that. Sorry, that was just a sidebar. I don't know who that was for, but it was for somebody. Impatience. When we think we need to help God, when we say, God, your timing's not working with my schedule. You know, God, you promised me this thing, and what do you know? It's a great opportunity for me to inherit this thing. Oh, you didn't give me the money. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get a credit card, put it on a credit card, because you're good for your word. He goes, I never even wanted you to do that. And now here you are saddled with debt. That's a very natural example of something that we do all the time. Let's go to uh, Galatians. <coughs> Just a few pages over. Galatians chapter 4. Verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons. Again, this is a call back to Genesis. It's written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondwoman, a servant, one by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. And it goes on to say these are symbolic, right? Abraham was promised a son. He said, I don't have it. God's like, you're going to inherit this land. He goes, I don't have an heir. How do I inherit something? I don't have an heir to give forth, and I'm up there in age. My wife, more so. <laughs> I'm struggling to believe. But he says, okay, I believe that. And then his wife comes along to help him. It's not her fault. She's thinking the same thing. I don't think I could do childbirth <laughs> this, this many years in age. So he gets the promise in Genesis 15. In Genesis 16, she comes to him and says, maybe God meant for you to sleep with my tent maiden. Like as like a surrogate kind of thing. If God meant that, he would have said that. But he didn't say that. He said, I'm going to give you a son from your seed. He was, he's with Sarah. That means that's the seed he's talking about, not trying to make something happen. See, when we get out of order, when God promises us something, remember, he's eternal. If he promises your healing and he tells you your healing's in 20 years, could you imagine living that 20 years, waiting, 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 waiting for that healing? God, why can't you heal me now? It's in 20 years. I've said it at that time. That's when you're going to be healed. Why? What did we just talk about for tribulation? What did we just talk about the things we worked through? He is God, and you are the man. You don't get to dictate when those things happen. But see, he doesn't tell us. Why? Because we would faint. If God told you that there was going to be a reuniting of 26 months of separation, it'd be hard to wake up every day crossing off another date, <laughs> multiple calendars going through. Man, kids can't wait 25 days for Christmas. Could you imagine setting things up like that? Yes, the longing is great, but the impatience would be greater. And then you'd start to begrudge and resent God. But see, when you have that vantage point of eternity, if he says, by, by my stripes you were healed, you say, okay, I'm, I'm going to be healed. When? doesn't matter when. I will be healed. This life, glorified body in the millennial reign, I will be healed. So I will not worry about when that takes place. I will not put that before God every day saying, where's my healing? Where's my healing? Where's my healing? He's promised it. So I'm going to get in that vantage point where I'm in eternity and I can see it. See, in Genesis 16, 
impatience, he has a son with the tent maiden. Son's name is Ishmael, not the son of promise, the son that Abraham pushed. Him and Sarah said, well, maybe this is what God meant. God's like, that's not what I meant. Here's the beautiful thing about God. He still blesses them. He still blesses Ishmael and says, you're going to still be, you're still going to, from you, create a nation. It's not the nation of promise that was going to go through the bloodline to get to Jesus, that he said, this is what I'm going to give you. Then Genesis 17, he has to be purified. There's 13 years between Ishmael and Isaac. What if God had promised that he was supposed to have Isaac 12 years prior? But now because of Ishmael, it has forced a delay. He's reaping what he had sown. We talk about it, we talk about it in this house. You birth it, you raise it, right? Because you're not gonna go dump a baby on somebody's doorstep, right? That's your job, your responsibility. And sometimes we give birth to things that we shouldn't have. But guess what? It's yours now. You can't just go, oh, sorry, didn't mean to do that, right? This has so many applications, if you'll hear it. Whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's people, whether it's a job or a position. If God says, I promise you're going to be a leader among people, I'm going to put you in a position where you can minister to people, and then you just start going, okay, I'm going to start applying for every manager job out there. Why not let him lead you and guide you to where you're supposed to be? He doesn't expect you to make it happen, because if you could make it happen, you would boast. But it's not about you. It's about the mercy and grace of God over your life, right? This impatience it drives him. Genesis 17, he has to be purified. He has to go through the circumcision as a grown man. Not, uh, not something I would recommend. Genesis 18, he gets promised again. He reminds him of that promise. You're, you're purified now. You're uncircumcised now. You're going to have a son. And then finally, Genesis 21, Isaac is born. Thirteen years later. What I'm trying to tell you is you do not want to rush God's timing. Because if God promises you something and then you go make it happen, it could literally hold back the thing God wanted to give you. Because you've already done it in your own strength. He goes, now I can't. You've now put this impediment in the way that I can't give you, right? If he says, Mike, I want to give you a yacht, he goes, awesome. He goes down, starts looking at yachts, starts looking at catalogs, and all of a sudden gets a phone call and says, hey, we got low financing, you can have a yacht. Oh. See, the natural man, how serendipitous. And they would go and, <laughs> they would go and pursue a yacht, thinking that was God, without even a, a, a thought to seek God on it. See, because the natural man wants it. They're going to look at every sign in the book and be like, oh, that's a sign, that's a sign, that's a sign. I should, nope, I have to get it. Look, this is like my third or fourth sign. Here's your sign. That's not it at all. See, because the enemy would love to put up signs too. Oh, yeah, here you go. Here's a yacht right here. Let me link you to this thing. Except it's coming at a certain time when it's going to take you out. Literally, a yacht takes you out, but it's going to take you out. You're going to be gone. All of a sudden, weekends, you're gone. All of a sudden, you're pushing off ministerial duties. We're wondering, what's going on? What's going on with Brother Mike? Yeah, he's on his yacht. He said he's seeking God, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? He got a shrimp boat. He calls it the gump. He's just out all the time. That's what he's doing. See, God knows you better than you know yourself. And when he says, I promise I'm going to give it to you, it's going to be in the right time. I promise my kids are going to have a license to drive, and I will help them get a car, Lord tarrying, which I don't believe he will. But I, can, but I can promise those things, and I will make good on those things. But does that mean I go out and do them now when he's six, seven, nine? Lincoln's 11. I mean, come on. How much damage could he deal? <laughs> Some of us laugh. A lot. He'll be, he'll be sitting there talking to the person about Minecraft crashing into yards. <coughs> we laugh in the natural, but in the spiritual, we think, we think that that applies. God promised it, I get it now. 
Who said? Galatians, let's go a little further. Galatians 6, um, verse 6 through 9. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he, he will also reap. For he who sows according to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Verse 9, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. See, when you sow in the flesh, it says you reap corruption. What God wanted for you to be a blessing, you made happen in the flesh, and now it corrupts your heart. Now it's distraction. Now it's caused division. Now you've alienated people. Now you've lost your faith. It's corruption. Little leaven leavens the whole lump. But the blessings of the Lord make rich and add no sorrow. Anything God's going to give you is not going to have a sorrow attached to it. He said, in me, you'll find peace. In the world, you'll find tribulation. So if you've birthed something out of season and you're finding tribulation, well, it says you're reaping what you sow because God promises peace. God promises no sorrow. So hopefully you look back and say, oh, my gosh, that's 100% me. Numbers 23, 19. And just write it down because it's a constant reminder. I love how it says, has he not spoken? Will he not make good? God is not a man that he should lie. He doesn't lie. The timing may not line up with us. I love in the chosen the fact that the, he keeps using the word soon, and it keeps messing people up. Well, how soon? Soon. Well, but what soon? Like, is it like a long soon, a short soon? Is it like the time between breakfast and lunch, or like the time between, you know, I'm young and I'm old? But see, he doesn't reveal those timings to us. If God told you, I'm coming back on X day, and everyone found out. What would everyone be doing up until that day? Whatever they wanted. They w and here's the thing that's really going to shake you. The way that you are right now, if Jesus was to come back, is the way you will be in the millennial reign. You don't suddenly go, I have been enlightened by God and I know everything and act holy. The way you are now, yes, you have, you have flesh. That will, be, that will be gone away, and you'll be like, oh, now I don't feel that tug of war. But your lack of character, your lack of discipline, your lack of faith of what God can do will impact you in the millennial reign. It will. Why do you think he's trying to work character now? So you can rule and reign with him. How terrible is it going to be? He's going to be like, man, Gave you the word. I gave you people that would just edify you, build you up, strengthen you, get you to grow up in God for you to come in the millennial reign. And I can't even put some, I can't have you lead a Bible study in the millennial reign because you're still selfish. You're still self-seeking, attention-seeking, whatever. You still lack the character to even suffer under the present suffering compared to the glory that he wants to reveal in you. Amen? Has he not spoken, will he not make good? When you feel that pull to make something happen, God says he'll supply all your needs. All of them. There's not one need he won't supply. That means you don't have to go out and try to make it happen. You should pray about what you should do. Okay, God. You've got to make a way. You tell me what to do, I'll do it. If he tells you to sell something, sell something. But if he doesn't tell you to sell something, don't go selling it. Oh, I traded in my car. Why? My electricity bill is high, but my God shall supply all my needs. Did he supply it or did you? Because if you did something to sell your car, whatever, now you made it happen in your own strength. Versus God going, oh, uh, let me just send you this check from a job seven years ago that you forgot about that had some extra hours that they had rounded off. There was nothing I could have done. Now you could say, well, that was still me seven years ago. Yeah, but why? Why now? Why moved now? Right? 
He can do those things. We, we read all the time about everything that God has done. You read the Old Testament, it's meant to glorify God. Every time he came through. Every time he came through. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He can, he will, but if not, we're still not going to bow down. Guess what? He came through. He still came through. You, the whole point of the Old Testament is to constantly be reading the faithfulness of God. And yet, when we come against something, that's not the first thing we reach for. He's faithful, but he's faithful, but this SDG and E bill might be too much for him. I'm picking on them because it's summer and they're just gouging. This video is not sponsored by SDG and E. I mean, we're paying for it, but it's not sponsored by SDG and E. <coughs> We need to have a revelation of, of going to God first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Not last resort, not red phone, right? Not break glass in case of. That's not the God we serve. All right, so impatience, that can, be, that can beset you. That could set you back. You could reap things that you've sown. You, can, you could delay what God is trying to do in your life. And the enemy goes, this is great. Thank you so much for doing that. Abraham birthed the son out of season, and now Christians today are still beheaded and persecuted because of one man's impatience. One man's impatience, thousands of years later, persecution and religious wars. Well, that won't happen with me, Kevin. Oh, I'm sure, you know, sure. I mean, who knows? God knows. That's why he tells you not to do those things. Don't birth things out of the flesh, amen? Second thing, you can get distracted. Oh, distractions. Sit here, squirrel. Shiny light. We just get drawn, drawn and enticed by distractions. You want to know why your walk is hard? You're distracted. If I was hiking and I was distracted and I kept tripping and falling, would I blame the mountain? Oh, these rocks, these traps that have beset me. Oh, my gosh, this is the hardest hill I've ever had to climb. You're walking next to me. I'm not tripping. I'm just looking. I'm just looking. I'm focused on that, the matter at hand, and you're off in la-la land not realizing that you are, going, you are going somewhere. Time moves forward. So if you're not focused on what you're doing, that doesn't mean that you're not moving. You're moving to the end because time doesn't stop. Amen? Let's go to Luke. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 30, 38. We can start at 38. Um, now it happened as they went that he entered, Jesus entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her, into her house. She had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus's feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to come and help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. Not just serving. Notice how he said many things. She said, she's not helping me serve. He goes, you're troubled about a lot of stuff, not just serving. How many of you know if you could read between the lines, be like Martha was really trying to show off. Martha really wanted that home to look because she thought the outward would reflect something on the inside. Here, Jesus is giving words of eternal life, and she's worried about replenishing the rolls on the table. You are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part. That word good is agapeo, which will not be taken away from her. When I say be eternally minded, it's because the enemy can't take that. It's the one thing the enemy can't take away. He could take your life. He 
can take your job, your car, he can take your kids, he can take your health. All of those things can happen in the world, the circumstances of the world. But what's the one thing he can't take away? That eternal life that you have, that vantage point that you can be above everything. Here, she's sitting here worried, troubled about many, many things. Making sure everything looks right for Jesus. We want to impress him. Got to drive up in the right car. Got to have the right job, the right clothes. Got to listen to the right, you know, listen to the right music, have the right food. If I ever come to your house and you are just like, you know, burning incense and have like Christian worship on and you're like, this is just how the way our home operates. I highly doubt it, especially if you have kids. That's not how your home operates. Your home rarely will operate like that with children because children behave and they're little souls. They act out. They are, you know, tossed by the waves of their emotion. You don't have to put on airs for Christ. He wants to change who you are, not what you look like. He wants to change that inner thing, and then the outer thing will work itself out. Amen? Uh, John chapter 14, verse 1 says, do not, let's go there actually. Because this is going to hit some of y'all. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And he goes through about the many mansions and, and things that you don't have to worry about. But let your hearts not be troubled. Distraction. We are living in a day and age where everything is trying to get your attention. It sells. On social media, it sells. In case you weren't aware, the amount of time you're sitting there on a social media post, it's counting how long you're looking at it. Why? So it can sell it to an advertiser. Well, no, that, that, they don't do that. Do you pay for Facebook? Do you pay for Instagram? How do you think they earn their money? Your attention is bought and paid for. They sell it to everything. And they'll find every which way they can get roots in to figure out what you like, where you want to go, what you think, what you believe. During past elections, Facebook has been investigated multiple times for putting intentionally opposite campaigns on your feed. So if you're Republican, they put Democrat. If you're Democrat, they put Republican. Because they wanted discord. They wanted anger because it provoked more engagement. The more engagement sold more money. So you look at a post for a little while, they sell it for change. You like or dislike or angry emoji, oh, I'm going to show them that I don't like it. Cha-ching, thank you. They don't care. Let me tell you something, nobody cares about your opinion. Nobody does. Nobody cares about your opinion. Bible says, let all men be liars, but God be true. It's the only opinion that matters. The whole world could forsake you, but if God doesn't, you're good. So stop acting like your opinion means something. My opinion means nothing. Every time I try to preach, everything should try to be founded in Scripture. Why? Because I could fall. I could make a mistake. My opinions can be wrong, but the Word of God will always be true. So I'm going to constantly try to push that. But if you engage in a post, angry, whatever, cha-ching, thank you. You comment on a post, well, you don't know what you're talking about. You're, you don't know. You're, n you're just woke. You're just blah, blah, blah. Congratulations. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Bible says they'll make merchandise of you. What do you think that means? They love to sell you your attention. Because the more you're focused and attentive to the temporal things, the less you are attending and focusing on God. And you just sell your attention. Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus. <gasps> Not Disney. <laughs> Disney's anti-God. I got, I got news for you. Pretty much everything that is of the earth is anti-God. The cosmos is anti-God as far as the ways of the world. The culture is anti-God. So stop being surprised when companies come out anti-God. Um, you need... I keep going back to that. Eternity in your heart. Revelation says there are things that must come to pass. There are things that are going to happen. 
the more we sit here and focus on the temporal, the less we're impacting the eternal in people's hearts. Let me tell you something. If you win Jesus, I'm going to say, tip some calves, and I know it's coming. Tipping, tipping some golden calves. If you win somebody over through manipulation using natural means or fear-mongering to get them to the gospel, they will not remain. Their fruit won't remain. That is an old methodology of turn or burn. That's not how God wants to reach people. I don't want my children to be like, oh, Father, I love you, because if not, you'd throw me out in the street and I'd have no food or shelter. Right? Thank you. It's, it's not, and don't misinterpret, well, well, you know, we, we can't stand idly by. I'm not saying you do, but I'm saying that's not the message you win people over with. People are supposed to look at your life and go, my God, something's different about you. Great, let me tell you what it is. Right? That's the true gospel. When you walk into a room and people go, what is that? I don't know, this guy just walked into the room. It felt different. There's no way people just impact the environment. Have you ever been around a fight? They absolutely impact the environment. Our emotions and things like that can impact the environment, and the Spirit of God can impact the environment. Because you can walk into rooms and change atmospheres. Not in a weird, spooky, spiritual, new agey way. I don't walk in burning incense. Everyone's like, oh, I'm smelling sage. Yeah, I bring that with me. It's the Spirit of God. Nothing natural about that. It's supernatural. If it was natural, I could take credit. But it's not natural. It's supernatural. It's God. It's the Spirit of God that can fall into a room or in a place because you've made an abode for him that he can dwell. But when you're distracted, when you're worried about a great many things, and he doesn't have your heart, he can't use you like that. It is possible, and it's not hard. Here's what it involves. Letting go. You don't understand. No, I do. I understand fully. Letting go. Surrendering wholly to God. Not being distracted by all these other things. Like he said right at the beginning, give me drugs, I'll give you real joy. Real joy. So it's the best exchange ever because you're just literally giving him garbage. You know, the worst stuff from your grandmother's basement that has, you know, that's probably not even usable now. And he goes, don't worry about it. I'm going to give you this new and improved thing. It's going to work so much better for your life. Let not your hearts be troubled. We should not succumb to fear. Fear should not be in our vocabulary. But it's really scary. Yeah. But if I have a vantage point, it's really not. Right? Whoa, they could do this, they could do that. Don't fear the person who can kill the body. Fear the one who can kill the soul, the Bible says. Right? What can man do to me? Well, they could do this and they could do that. Okay. That doesn't change my interaction or relationship with God whatsoever. It's the one thing the enemy can't take away. But see, if your confidence and your reliance and your focus and your attention is on all these other things that are like whack-a-mole, well, then the enemy just bop, 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 and you're like, oh, I can't win. It's because you're playing the wrong game. Right? Open the machine up. Take all the tickets out of the back. Boom, you win. <laughs> That's the long game. After hours when they close. Just kidding. Mark. <laughs> Let's go to Mark chapter 4. Hmm. Um, verse 18. This is so good. We've all heard the parable. The sower goes out to sow seed, right? He throws it among different grounds. But we're going to start at verse 18. Now these are the ones, the seed, that is sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. And the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. You want to know why the word isn't, isn't empowered in your life? This right here. 
That word unfruitful is a karpos. It means it's not originated or empowered by God. It mean, doesn't mean that it's nothing. It's not, it's not like, oh, there's no fruit. It means that it's not fruit that God is empowering or originated. You could build something with it. You can do, it, it depicts you building this wonderful, great thing, but God not being in it. So what is it? Nothing. It's unfruitful. The world will look at it and go, that's great. Ooh, that's wonderful. This is why Christians can have really good character. This is why Christians can seem like good old boys. And the world will look at it and say, wow, that's really good. And God goes, yeah, it's unfruitful. Because it didn't, it's not originated from me. It's not empowered through me. They've let the worries of the world, the cares of the world, the desire for other things choke the word. And now it can't serve the purpose it was meant to in their life. The word of God is quick and powerful. You are supposed to go to the word and it applies. You're supposed to go to the word and it's real. You're supposed to go to the word and it changes you. But when it ceases doing that, then you're hearing the word and all these other things are choking it out. If you look at someone's life and you're jealous because it looks like something's operating in their life that's not in yours, I would double check to see what type of ground you are. 90% of the time, it's these thorns. I remember in my backyard, I was like, <laughs> my kids went out and they're like, look at all these beautiful flowers, Dad. I said, no, buddy, those are weeds. <laughs> those aren't flowers. <gasps> but they look so nice. Yeah, they look nice, right? People could look at them and be, I remember looking at some of them, they kind of look like sunflowers. Yeah, but they're not. But look at these ones, little pink petals. Yeah, those are going to turn into goat heads and they're gonna, you're going to hate them because you're going to step on them and they're going to prick you. But they don't have them now. No, they don't have them right now. They're blending in. But what are they doing under the surface? It's choking out the life of any other vegetation around them. Sucking in all the water so that the plants can't get the nutrients. See, sometimes th that word falls, falls among the thorns, but they don't look like thorns yet because sin has pleasure for a season. And you're in that season where it's pleasurable and you're like, oh, yeah, I know. I got the word of God. Yeah, but you don't realize that that weed in you, that thorn, is choking the very life. The word that God has said. My, my words are spirit and life. You can have a life through these words. We need to stop being distracted by every little thing of the world. We need to find an elevated position where we no longer fear what command can do. We no longer worry about the daily things because those things keep us out of the will of God in our life and keep things from being powerful in our life. Amen? Luke, if you go a uh, few pages over, Luke chapter 9, verse 62. But Jesus said to him, this is, so right after here, he's going through a list, and these guys are like, I'm going to follow you. And he goes, are you sure? I don't even have a place to lay my head. I'm living in the wilderness. Are you sure that's what you want? Oh, I'll follow you. Okay. I just have to go bury my dad. Sorry, I'm still moving. If, that, if that's what you're going to Well, that's, Kevin, that's, that's an important thing. I'm sure, I'm sure you think it is. But if the Messiah was to come along and ask you to follow him, there shouldn't be anything. You should be dropping nets. You should say, let the dead bury the dead. Not zombies burying the dead. Let the dead people who care about the carnal earthly things bury the dead. Because I'm going to focus on the life. Man comes and says, let me go say goodbye to people. That's not what he's about. So verse, verse 62, but Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. I look that word fit up because I'm like, okay, just to be clear, God, <laughs> when you say fit, does that mean they'll make it, but they're just not going to be as good as other people? No. Uh, the word fit means not suitable or useful, almost as if like a puzzle piece, it just won't go in. You're not fit for the kingdom. Why? You're not going to connect to anything else that God has for you. Why? Because you're looking back. What, what's behind a plow? If you're plowing something, any farmers, anybody know anything about tilling ground? 
you've ever tilled ground, there you go, Luke, Luke raised his hand very slowly. If you till the ground, what's behind you? Just dirt. But not just the ground you walked on, it's churned up and hopefully broken up into mounds, right? You leave just a wake of mounds. Now what he's depicting here is he's saying, it's not that you're looking back being like, oh, did I hit the right thing? No, you're looking back as if there's something back there that shouldn't have been destroyed. You're looking over your shoulder saying, oh man, we had to till that God. He goes, don't worry about it. Just take your hands off the plow. You're not done. When you're done, we can go and plow again. But obviously you care so much about what I'm trying to destroy in you so I can create something in you. What are you holding on to that's worth saving? Nothing. But we cling to these things, these distractions in our life, whether it's clubs or, or, or relationships or even education can be just a stronghold for people. I've known people that have gone to school for 10, 12 years. For what? Does it change anything about the gospel of God? Will it have any lasting effect in eternity? None. Now, I'm not against education. I think kids should learn an education because, for one thing, they should definitely learn how our government works. Um, for another thing, they should definitely learn, you know, basic math and things that help them survive. I understand those things. But what I'm saying is there comes a time when you grow up and you're done with education and you move on to the eternal things in your life, the things that matter. And you're willing to sell cars, leave cars, leave jobs, change homes for Christ. Because sometimes that's what it costs. And sometimes, like Abraham, it doesn't cost the actual thing. It just costs the willingness to do it. Did Abraham really kill Isaac on the altar? No. Dagger there, though. It said an angel had to stop him, right? Had to stay the blade, which means that was already coming down. Abraham had the faith that God's going to have to basically resurrect his son. He's willing to go that far to please God and prove his faith. Every distraction, every... Whether it's fear, whether it's motivation for learning, research, whatever it is, those are distractions because this is the only thing that matters. I don't read a lot of books. I read these books. What about other people? They might know things that you don't know. That's true. I can, you know, and I'm not saying I don't listen to other ministers and things like that, but I'm very selective because I don't want, I, I, I don't, the Bible says be not many masters. Why? Because you're going to heap on additional condemnation that might not be God. So I'm very attentive to, if a man preaches the word, Bobby Connor is one of my favorites, because literally every second, second and third sentence out of his mouth is a scripture. I've never heard a man speak more word than Bobby Connor. It just flows out of him, and you're just like, oh, oh. He doesn't always throw the reference either, so sometimes you think he's talking, and then you're like, wait, that's a scripture somewhere. Because it's so, the word is engrafted into who he is. We want to get to that place where these distractions and things like that, they hold no power over us. Amen? <clears throat> so, there's nothing back there, looking back from the plow, there's nothing back there, it should have been tilled. If you look back remorseful, if you look back, oh God, why'd you have to go and do that? <sighs> I had to work hard for that. I'm sorry, not, <laughs> right? I'm the creator. If you're the clay, how could you look at me and say, but I worked really, really hard to be that lump of clay. Well, I want you to be, you know, a vase or something. No, look it, you got rid of that lump. That was my favorite lump. <laughs> I worked hard. I went four years to a college to get that lump. <laughs> I spent years in clubs and, and, and investing time with other people to, to, to get the knowledge of that lump. And he goes, yeah, I don't really care about that. If anything, it actually hinders what I'm trying to do through you. I would, I would prefer you to have not had the lump, but you got the lump, so I'm going to work with what I got. 
we think that sometimes because of whatever learning or however much time, we also think that the time we've been saved merits anything. Because you can be saved 20 years and have never moved on from the basic principles of God. And the Bible says you're still a babe. Goo goo gaga. But saved 20 years, so the goo goo gaga means a lot more now. <laughs> no, it doesn't. See, if our, if our inward man changes and we renew our mind and the outward then starts to reflect it, that's maturity. That's growing up. Getting older in the faith is just that. If, if I take flour and I dump it on my counter and I leave it for years and years, does it become bread? Does time change the, the flour whatsoever? If anything, it might just make it nasty, stale, not usable anymore. So we got to stop thinking that, well, you know, I've been saved for X amount of years, so that makes a big difference. It doesn't. If anything, it testifies of slow learning. Because it ought not take that many years. He began this with a time when you ought to. Well, I've been saved 25 years. Now, some of us, I get it. You're like, well, I was in a church that didn't believe that, or I was always taught this, and great. But now that you know, what are you doing with it? Now that you know. We go, yeah, the water's deeper, but you're still sitting in ankle-deep water going, well, I was raised. I didn't know. Okay, but now I've shown you that there's deeper water. But, but that, you know, 20 years invested in this, Kevin. In what? Standing in a puddle? There's deeper things. I said golden calves. There's things we're going to tip over. Isaiah, this is, the, this is where, where, where it all started. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1. And I, as I read this, I want you to sit there and think, okay, well, how's this apply to me? Because Egypt, the title of the message is about Egypt, right? And you're like, well... Kevin, I've never been to Egypt, so how could I go back to Egypt? Egypt is representative of the old way of doing things, the old life, before you've been liberated, before God brought you out of the world, right? So Egypt is going back to those things. Verse 1, Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel, but not of me, and who devise plans, but not of my spirit. That they may add sin to sin, building upon itself. Who walk to go down to Egypt and have not asked my advice to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. And then he goes on to talk about how it's going to be your shame and your undoing. We don't go to Egypt for help. We're not supposed to. God gives us everything we need if we would let go of the world and follow him. But when we constantly go back, when we say, well, God's going to supply some of, his, some of my needs, but some of these other needs I'm just going to go and get myself, that's going back to Egypt. Because God says he supplies us all your needs, all of them. Well, I mean, I attend church on Sunday, and I believe, I'm going to give him my eternal self, but the temporal self, Monday through Saturday, that's me. Now, now we're getting into the final thing that trips you up. Mixture. Want to know why your walk is so hard? You're mixed up. I said in the beginning, you've got two yokes. You're not supposed to have two yokes. One yoke is plenty. And if you had to choose between the yoke that's heavy and destructive and leads to death and the yoke that's light and easy and has peace... You should choose life, right? You woe to those who go to Egypt for help. Psalms 121.12 says, my help comes from the Lord. Well, that's true, but then, you know, when such and such happens, I'll go to science. Oh, I forgot. That's somewhere in there, too. God said, come to me for everything unless man has a solution, then go to man. See, the enemy has worked so hard to try to have a solution for everything you need so that you don't go to God. Romans made up all kinds of gods for everything. Oh, you want a blessed journey? You pray to this God. Oh, you want love? You pray to this God. You want a child? You pray to this God. The beautiful thing about God is God is one. We go to him for everything. 
He has different names, but they all relate to the same person, right? Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, right? He's still those things to us. The simplicity of the gospel is he's our source. Mixture. Don't complicate things. God says that he can heal, right? He talks about restoring our soul. Let me tell you something. If you go down the help for psychiatry for something that God says he can do, that's tough. The world's burden is tough. They will seek to medicate. They'll seek to do all kinds of things. I'm not against necessarily saying, well, if God provides a way for you to get a healthy escape through health or through medicine, I'm not saying you forsake those things. He doesn't say that you devise plans is bad. He says you devise plans not of my spirit. You take counsel, but not of me. God may very well send you to a doctor, but it's going to be a specific doctor who he knows can help you and isn't going to market or merchandise you. Amen? Just like he may send you to a little church in Ramona to go through deliverance, so then all of a sudden those things aren't so in your head that you think you have schizophrenia, and it turns out you just have a bunch of demonic spirits talking to you. And those things can be cast away. Cast away. See, and people go, well, but Kevin, that's, that's like health. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. God created us, but he can't do anything with us. We need a specialty mechanic for that. Where's your faith? Where's your faith? He created it so that he is the source. When you're mixing sources, you're complicating things. I love the fact that I just have to worship and praise God. I don't have to worry about getting a specific sacrifice for a specific God because I'm going to take a road trip with my family. Right? Isn't that a blessing? It's one source that I can go to for everything. Don't complicate things with mixture. That goes for spiritual stuff too. Sometimes people, I'm telling you, I've seen people go into new age stuff and be like, oh, well, like water is life and therefore water is God and we could do, oh my gosh, people. You just, <laughs> gone off. It's really simple. It's really simple. The gospel is not hard. You can believe God for things, and they happen in his time. And with a high vantage point of eternity, everything else just seems small. That's the simplicity. That's the good news, is that you don't have to be the way you were, that he can make you better in this life and the next, and that the things you go through are working in you a better version of yourself. That's the good news. There's no 12 steps to recovery. You recover in Jesus' name. Amen? You transform. 1 Corinthians. Wow, I'm going, I'm now I'm behind. 1 Corinthians, not really behind. You guys are subject to this. Just kidding. You can leave anytime. 1 Corinthians. Come on. Uh, chapter 3, verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool so he can become wise. Let me break that down for you. If you think you're smart, become dumb so God can make you smart. That's, that'll be the, the Kevin literal translation. You think you know but you don't know, so act like you don't know so God can tell you. Well, but I read Dr. So-and-so's book, and they say, who's Dr. So-and-so? I don't see him in the Bible. Never seen anything great that he's ever done for God in this book. Never drawn life from them. This book, right? I love that. Let no one deceive himself. If any among you be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. Submit your mind to Christ. Well, I know because I took some courses in college about psychology, so I can tell you this. 
What does that mean? Nothing. We'll get to that in a minute because Paul talks very frank about that stuff. Be a fool to be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. The wisdom of which world? This world. The wisest people in this world that think they know, God says they're foolish. You don't know. Uh, For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness, meaning setting them up for their own devices and own traps. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. They're going the wrong way. They will bear no fruit. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whose? God's. Whether Paul or Apollos or, or, or Cyphus or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Let no one deceive himself. we got to be very, very mindful of our own self-deception, thinking we know things. That's why I said, how do you, how do you, how do you get to that place in God? Where your walk is easy, you let go. But I paid a lot for that, let go. No, you don't understand. Like, this is like a really big deal to the world. Let it go. Because it's not going to bear the fruit, not the way that he wants it. Let's go uh, Romans chapter 12. I'm almost done, I promise. I know it's getting later. And I apologize. I don't really, because I feel like God's talking to people. But. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Living sacrifice, meaning you're alive, but you're ready to die at any moment for whatever God needs. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Gosh, it's the bare minimum you could do. This is not like, oh, some great thing, like, oh, thank you, angels in heaven being like, oh, he preserved himself blameless. This is your reasonable service. Like, this is what you should do because he's a holy God. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be not conformed. Don't pattern after. Be transformed. That word transform, the metamorpho, is allowing the inward to change coming out. Not what you did in the soul. Nothing you do in the soul matters. When I say soul, we have a soul, we have a spirit, we have a body. We are a triune being made in the likeness and image of God. Your soul, mind, will, and emotions, everything you do with your own mind and your own strength and your own education and your own upbringing and your own, all of that (laughs) compared to what he does in the spirit. And I know that can be hard sometimes because we really, 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 really love to be in the know, that pride and vanity. (coughs) Second Corinthians, we'll flip back. Uh, Chapter 1, verse 12. I love this one. I know I'm kind of moving fast, just mark them. Second Corinthians 1, 12. For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we conducted ourselves in the world with in simplicity and godly sincerity not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly towards you. How did we behave ourselves in this world? With simplicity and godly sincerity. You know, I have always found it funny that younger school teachers, teachers that teach kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, man, they're a hoot. They're a lot of fun. They're very sincere about what they do and how they care about kids. You know what my college professor does? Doesn't care about anything. Did you turn in your homework? I get paid either way. Isn't that funny? How over time, like the higher education you get to, the less sincere they really are. I really feel there's something in the natural that happens that as we get so smart, we just start disassociating from the humble beginnings of our lives that we've elevated this thing to be some great thing and that we can't connect to people the same way. We have to be very careful. We guard our heart and we never lose sight of we all started somewhere. You are alive who once were dead. How dead? Dead. 
not degrees of dead. You were dead. Let, we have to be very mindful that we operate in this world, conducted ourselves in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity. God, the, the gospel is simple. Man tries to complicate it. Man tries to build it up into things. Man makes programs, and they sell books and literature, and they try to make the steps, and they do the things where you earn badges or whatever or sashes. Man makes things complicated because they can profit off that. The Bible says freely receive, freely give. And it is a gift that you give, and then that's it. It's a one-step program. You acknowledge Christ as the king, who he already is. You're just acknowledging it so you can live for him, and all of a sudden, you let go of everything else. It's easy. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, just a few pages over. Uh, chapter 11, verse 2. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. You don't have other lovers. Christ is your only lover. That's who you are betrothed to. So all these mixture and all these other things, all the teachings of so-and-so and and books by Dr. So-and-so, that's not who you're betrothed to. You're betrothed to Christ. But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we've not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which we have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. See, the problem is when we, keep, when we start complicating things and going that way, it opens the door for us to start believing things that are not found in the gospel. And things you'd be like, there's no way I'd fall for that. Yeah, you would. Look at the past few years, just in the natural, what we fell for, what we've put up with, right? America at large, just the world at large, put up with things. And you're like, there's no way, there's no way. Why? Because the deceitfulness. You guys have to uh, get, a, get the understanding that Lucifer's been around a very, 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 very long time. And he's extremely crafty. I don't blame Eve. He's extremely crafty. He's going to try to corrupt your minds with mixture. You don't want your mind to be corrupted from the simplicity of God. And sometimes it's hard to see whether you have a corrupted mind, but it's like a virus on your computer, right? Right? You don't always notice you have a virus on your computer. It doesn't spring, you have a virus. I mean, they do, but that's their way to actually get the virus on your computer. Don't fall for that. You don't probably have a virus if that pops up. But what happens is, all of a sudden, your computer takes a lot longer to turn on. All of a sudden, programs aren't running. Just slowly but surely, little things just start breaking down. Why? Because you have a virus that's slowly corrupting your computer. If it just shut everything down right at the beginning, you'd know something was wrong, and it wouldn't get everything that it needs. So what does it do? Pilfers, little by little. You hardly notice until eventually you put up with things that you didn't think you'd put up with. That's you in the spirit. You start giving your mind and your focus and your attention to these other things. Whatever they are, you start having a believing heart of them over the gospel of God. I would never says here, you may well put up with it because you've given those things. Last scripture, and then I'm done, I promise. I want to end with some stuff. Philippians chapter 3. You can read from verse 1, but I'm not going to because it goes through talking about how Paul is just such this, if you think you could boast, if you think you are deserving, if you think you are holy, you should hear his pedigree. And he goes down a laundry list of all the things and tribes he's from and how pure he was and circumcised on the eighth day and followed the law and all these wonderful things that in that time would be good. That's like me saying I tithe and I come early. I make sure I'm there for worship and I help collect the offering. And I do, right? You start going down this list. I was raised in the church. I was blah, 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 blah. Verse 8, yet indeed... I also count all these things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, 
for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them rubbish that I might gain him. That word rubbish in the King James, I love it better because it just says dung. Rubbish, we're like, oh, it's kind of trash. <laughs> no, it's waste. There is no redeeming quality for it. Now, see, if you live like that, if you renew your mind to where everything that is not of him, that's not his knowledge, that's not his purpose in your life, if you look at all of that as dung, I promise you this walk is easy. So easy. Easiest walk ever. Because nothing else matters. He'll take care of all those other things. You know why? Because the more I focus on him, the better father I become. The more I focus on him, the better husband I become. The better friend I become, the better teacher I become, better employee I become, whatever. You can go down the laundry list, but it's not because I focus on those things. I focus on the thing that's needed. I focus on that one thing that's needed that the enemy can't take away. And it just proliferates in my life. It multiplies. And all of a sudden, it's touching all these areas that it wasn't touching before. That if I focused on my best day, I could not be a good husband compared to what Christ can make me as a good husband. Amen? I'm hoping it's quiet because there's conviction and not that I'm losing people. Because it is simple. We need to stop shooting ourselves in the foot and saying we're under spiritual attack. We need to stop looking at carnal things and saying they're tribulation when you're sowing and reaping. You want good things from God? Sow good things in God. Right? It's not, it, that's, that's the simplicity of it. No, that's too easy. You said before there's spirits working at us and Starbucks got my order wrong and it ruined my whole day. And I know, I know, I know spiritual warfare. Someone gets convicted. Oh, man, I was really mad because I didn't notice till I got home. And that's like four miles away. Oh. You don't know tribulation. You're still running with the footmen and getting weary. And God's like, man, there's horses coming. Quit looking back behind the plow. I know I'm using like lots of analogies, but it's because it's all saying the same thing. It's all saying the same thing. I have we sang at the beginning that this is an invitation that God can move in this place that things can happen in this place and we truly believe that which is why we always try to operate from a place that you can leave changed the things you came in with you do not have to leave with the Bible says the anointing breaks the yoke. So right now, if there's anointing that can break that yoke on you, that you feel is constantly weighing you down, that you feel like a double-minded man, unstable in all your ways, then I believe the Lord can break those things off of you. Um, we have a song that we practiced, <coughs> and I may have them come up and sing, but I'm going to make sure with my father that he, he says what he needs to say. But the song is called Manessa, Manasseh, and in the Hebrew it means to forget, but it means God helps me to forget. Helps me to forget. Why would God need to help you to forget? Because sometimes you are your worst enemy of your own mistakes and your own problems and your own distractions and your own God, help me to forget. That's what Joseph named his first son after going through all the hardships that he went through, all the trials, because he couldn't keep his mouth shut, telling his brothers, you're all going to bow down before me one day. Oh, isn't that special? Of course you're going to get beat up. But he goes through all these hardships, and a lot of them unjustified. He's charged falsely and everything. And you can look at the whole tribulation and go, why, God, why? But we knew what it was working in him. And so he named his firstborn Manasseh so that way he could help. Ha he, he thought that that son was the beginning 
of a new life that he had with God, that he can make him forget all of the past and all of those other things that, we, he, that would be so easy to cling on to, that we need to forget. Who you got? Casting all your cares on him because he cares for you. The word care actually means distractions. I'm just going to name a few things that up. Relationships. Some of y'all have been in relationships that are work. Listen. Stop reading. Listen. You're in relationships that are a lot of work. You know why? They're not God. You keep trying to make it God, and it's still more work, more work, more work. The blessing of the Lord make rich and add this is not work. This is not hard. Now, I ain't talking about you that are married. <laughs> you don't got an out. You just got to work at it. But even in that, if it's still work when you're married, it's because somebody's doing something wrong. Somebody's got some distractions. Somebody has other lovers. You don't have to be physically unfaithful to somebody to have other lovers things that have your time, things that you give your heart to. People know when they have your heart when they don't. So there's relationships in here that need to get right with God, number one. Number two, time. You can't get that back. Be careful in the time that we live. If we really believe that we only have so many years left before Jesus comes, why are we filling it up with things that don't profit the kingdom? We say we believe that. Oh, he's coming soon. Well, if you really believe that, you better put, put the pedal to That's what that scripture means. If you run with footmen, if you've been a foot soldier and you're weary doing that, what are you going to do when you have to contend with horses? What are you going to do in a year from now when the world is totally upside down? You know, people started saying there's, there's more than two genders. If you say it enough, they believe it. 6,000 years, there's only been two. In the last few years, every news station on the planet says, no, there's, there's multiple, there's multiple, more, more, more. Now, if you say there's two genders, people look at you like, what's wrong with you? 6,000 years of history tell us there's two. God's word tells us there's two. But man starts saying, no, there's bunches of them, 150-something and counting. If you say it enough, people believe it. The Bible says, let all men be liars, but God be true. Some of y'all keep listening to everything, and that's your downfall. Quit listening to everything and everybody. Start keeping it. Go back to the simplicity. Be an audience of one. God, that's all that matters. What saith the scriptures? What does God say? Where's your heart? What's your first love? Who are you passionate about? I'm more in love with Jesus today than I was 50 years ago. Now, that, that only happens in the kingdom. You can't stay passionate about something for 50 years it's just almost impossible, but, but you can in God because he, because as you love him, he loves you. He just keeps revealing how much he loves you. I realize he loves me more today than I did when I first started. So this is a message that I believe you could have a supernatural, when there's tacos waiting, whose gods are your belly, wait a minute. They'll still be there. How long does it take to make this journey? How long does it take to let go? It didn't take very long. When God said to me, he said, you want, you let go of this, I'll give you this. And he did that with me with lots of things. My music back in the day, it wasn't edifying. And I, and I went and got rid of it. And then he just supernaturally started giving me albums and stuff. God doesn't want you single people to go around, I'm single for Jesus, I'm just a loner for the Lord. 
He'll give you somebody, but let, is, can you honestly say the choice you have made is God's choice? If it's God's choice, why is it so much work? Why is there compromise? There shouldn't be compromise when it's God. I want This woman aids me, pushes me in, to go forward with God. That's what you want. You want someone that and helps you to go on, not tempts you to go back. So, relationships he's, he's dealing with today. Time. Quit giving your time to the world. You only got a little bit left. You'll kick yourself during the millennial reign when you go, man, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't given up that time. Some of y'all, it's stuff. Stuff's an easy one. It's just stuff. Let it go. Everything I've given to God, he's always gave me back better. I've given cars to the Lord, to other people, and he gave me better cards, cars. I've given guitars. I always got, he gives, gives me guitars. Whatever you sow, you reap. I mean, quit hanging on to it like this is my identity. This is my identity. Your car isn't who you are. Your guitar isn't who you are. Your bass. Whatever you do, that's not who you are. Give it to him whose right it is. It's his right. If you'll just let go today in just prayer, just it's a prayer. It's I let go and mean it. That's it. It's the key is you mean it. I'm not trying to emotionally work you up to pray this prayer or something. Keep it. I'm almost there. No, I'm not trying. I'm not begging you to get right with God. This message should have done that for the last hour and a half. It plowed me. There's always things you, God's going after in all of us. But for a time when you ought to be somewhere else and you're still where you're back, I know, I know y'all by name. I know where you where you are. I know where you should be. And what's keeping you from moving into that is you're hanging on to stuff you shouldn't be hanging on to. And we would not be shepherds if we didn't tell you as shepherds, okay, you're you're not stuck in the thicket over here. You run to it. You, know, you want us to cut it down and stuff, but if we and we lead you somewhere else, but you just always go back to it. Because loneliness to you is, is, is bigger than God. And see, God says he filleth all in all. You shouldn't be lonely. God can, there's no loneliness in, in God. You shouldn't have to, you don't need a man or a woman to meet that thing in you if you're lonely. God can fill that first. Until he fills that, you ain't ready for a man or a woman because you, that person will become God to you. And God loves you too much to give you a false God. You got to be happy. Happy. So you have your happiness to share with somebody else. Some of y'all are looking for people to be your happiness. Boy, you're putting them a, a big, them some huge shoes no man can fill. No woman can fill. Your peace comes from God. So let's do that today. Bow your heads. So, can we do that? Yeah. Who's singing it? Come on. Come up here to sing this song. I don't really feel like the, the I mean, we're going to do it, but I don't feel like God's pulling on emotions today. We're talking frank. We're talking man to man. We don't need to woo you up here by some emotional thing, but I believe that the, there's anointing on music, so I get that. Okay? My wife said, it's a good song. So I, I took that as, not a thus saith the Lord, but close. So we're going to let this music minister to you. But i am tell you what, we're, uh, we can turn down the lights just a little bit. Because I want, I want people... 
I can't really see you guys in the balcony. I know you're closer to God than we are down here, but that's okay. If he's speaking to you, it's just a prayer. You're a prayer away from saying, God, I give it to you. I heard the word today. It applies to me. My golden calves are they're laying on the ground. Help me not to go back and pick them up. How many times have we been in a service like today where the Lord, Holy Spirit knocked over that golden calf, revealed to us that is your enemy, and we are under conviction, we bowed our head, and we prayed that this thing would hurry up and get over so we could go back and pick it up and put it back in that place in our life. We're not doing that today. So don't pray if you don't mean it. Because I believe he will take you up on that. If you want to get serious with God and you say, there's things in my life that are keeping me from moving on with God. Lord, all my, and there was some of y'all, I'm, I'm seeing in the spirit, there's golden calves. They're laying all around you. Some of y'all got more than one. But don't go picking them up. Just leave them there. God knocked them. He dethroned them for your benefit. So you could get out of there and get back on the path. Because that thing he talked about, pilfer that mixture one day you wake up and you're not backsliding you're backslidden now there is no peace you've walked away from jesus it didn't happen overnight there's a song that says white doesn't suddenly go ahead and play white doesn't suddenly turn black it goes through many changing shades of gray likewise the christian life you don't fall from the love of god in one day this is a process. This is wooing you out into the wilderness. And then you wake up one day and you're just, oh my gosh, where's Jesus? You walked away. He knocked. He cried, come back. And you just kept walking. Some of y'all need to come home. You're in the wilderness. You need to come home. You need to quit pretending and trying to tell everybody it's okay when it's not. You know whether you have peace with God. All right. While they're playing, how many today go, that, he's talking to me, Brother Mike, he's talking to me. The sermon was for me. The, I heard things today that I can't get away from. We don't want you to get away. We want you to stare at it till it changes you. So if that happened to you and you're being real, this is the best part of this. Everything was brought to this point. This is why he studied. This is why all this is happening, to get you to a place where you say to God, that's me. I'm ready to let it go. I'm ready for change. I'm tired of doing it my way. I'm tired of being hard. It's not supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be easy. Jesus should be your best friend. His ways are so much better than our ways. So if he's talking to you and you're ready for change and you want to change your life, then stand up right now because we're going to pray. That's your invitation. Stand up. Wherever you are, stand up. You're ready for change. This is not going to, there's something that was revealed to you that's got to change in your life. It's an Ishmael. It's persecuting the work of God in you. He's trying to change that. Get Cast out the scorner, the Bible says in Proverbs. Cast out the mocker, that thing that's mocking you. Cast it out, and yea, contention and strife will cease. You tired of being at strife with? Tired of being at strife with yourself? Cast it out. Let it go. I want you to lift your hands right now to the Lord as a sign of surrendering and saying, "And I'm going to pray a prayer." And if you're in agreement with this prayer, just let, just keep your hands up and just say, "This that's my prayer, Jesus." Well, Brother Mike is praying. That's me. I'm, I'm laying hold of that prayer, and God will apply that as though it came out of your mouth. Heavenly Father, I come before your throne of grace with my hands lifted before you as a sign of surrendering. I do what Kevin said today. I let go. I let go. I let go of, if you're in a relationship that's worn against the Spirit of God in you, you feel like that it's a, it's a constant compromise between God and the Holy Spirit in, in this person. I put this person on the altar today, Jesus. I don't want no one or nothing in my life. I don't want to love anything more than you. 
I, I surrender it to you right now, Jesus. And if I have to walk away from it, I will. I walked away from every one of my friends because when I got saved, they were all in the world. And I spent a year not having any friends. But you know what? I had Jesus. And that was more than enough. His name is El Shaddai. It means more than enough. He was more than enough friends for me. Man, God, I just see things falling off some of you. Some of y'all about to get free and free. I mean free. Time. God, I give you my time. It's no longer mine. I give you my time. I will not do anything except I confer with you and make sure that you're okay with this because anything that I do is going to require time. And I realize time is limited because we're coming to the, this is the end of the last days. Your coming is at hand. And if I'm going to do something for the kingdom, I better get, I better give you time to do it. So I'm not going to get involved in a lot of things that eat up my time. I give you time today, God. With my hands lifted up, I surrender time to you. And that means sports. That means music. That means what hobbies. That means whatever. I give it to him whose right it is. It's your right, God. You bought me with your own son's blood. I give you my time. I'm going to tell you what, you give God time, you'll have more time than you've ever imagined. When people say, Brother Mike, I don't have any spare time. That's because you, you're you using it all up. I give time to God all the time. I minister to people all the time. Guess what? He gives me plenty of time to do the things I want to do. If you don't have any spare time, it's because you're not giving God time. We're going to give him time. We give you time. Every golden calf that was knocked over, and to, every, to different people standing, it means different things. Some of y'all, it's drinking. That should be gone by now, folks. Come on. Some of y'all, it's profanity. It should be gone by now. Some of y'all, it's lust. It's different things. It should have been gone by now. Whatever that golden calf is, whatever the Holy Spirit said, that's it right there. The Lord's already knocked it down. We just refuse to pick it up. With your hands lifted, we say, Lord, I refuse to pick up that golden calf in the name of Jesus. By the grace of God, I'm walking away from that golden calf. It means it's a false God. It's not real. I'm not relying on that thing to give me pleasure anymore because the Bible says sin has pleasure for a season, for a season, but then there's so much pain that comes afterwards. The ple I love that the pleasure of God is forevermore. In your right hand, there's f the fullness of the uh, of the fullness of joy is in the Lord, and there's in His right hand there's pleasures evermore. They're they're eternal. The things that God gives you doesn't bring conviction. It doesn't quench your spirit. The friends that God gives you that's another one. Friends. We're putting our friends on the altar. If they're, if I'm trying to reach them, brother, my, you're enduring stuff that God's not requiring you to endure. You're being vexed by friendships that are of the world, and you shouldn't have. Bible says the friendship of the world is enmity against God. Those aren't God. Those aren't your friends. We are. Those are people we're witnessing to, not friendships. We're putting it on the altar. Every relationship in our life we put on the altar right now in Jesus' name. Every relationship. Lord, nothing stands between you and us. Nothing. Nothing stands between Jesus and me. I give it to him who's right it is. If you're in agreement with that prayer, I believe, I believe that's the Holy Ghost right there. The, if you're in agreement with it, just say it to Jesus. That's my prayer, Lord, not Brother Mike's prayer. That's my prayer. That's my prayer. I give you my friends. I give you my time. I give you my resources. I give you my hobbies. I give you everything. Here it is. Jesus, be Lord of my life. Not just my Savior, the forgiver of my sins. We all need to be forgiven. But Lord, take, be the boss. I don't want to be the boss. That's what making Jesus Lord means. He's the one who makes the decisions, the final authority. He, he, it's, you run it by him. If he says yes, it's yes. If he says no, it's no. But he is Lord of your life. Jesus, every hand raised right now that is crying out to you, make Jesus be Lord of my life. Lord, I pray that you receive that and you be the Lord of their life.
life, and this is a turning point from them. They're never going to be the same. Their walk with God is getting, they're being wooed by the Holy Spirit into the deep waters. They're getting out of that shallow end of the pool with all their floaties saying, I'm swimming, I'm swimming. They, they couldn't drown if, you, if, if angels tried to hold them under. There's so much flotation on them. But we're, we're not pretending that we're swimming. We're learning to swim. We're not saying we're in deep water. We're getting, we're going to the deep water. So, Lord, I thank you that the tide of the Holy Spirit just draws us. It's not a cyclone. It's not a, a tidal wave. It's a wooing. It's a drawing of the presence of God saying, come on, son, let's go. Let's go deeper. Let's walk away from this shallow stuff. Let's walk away from these golden calves. I'm going to lead you far away from this where this won't be a temptation anymore. I want to show you what it means to be yoked with me, that my burden is easy, my yoke is easy, my burden's light. It's not hard to be a Christian when you're surrendered. When you've let go of the world, it's not hard to follow Jesus. You know what's hard? Trying to follow the world and follow Jesus because they're not going the same way. So we just put that on the altar right now. Praise God. Boy, there is a move of the Holy Ghost going on right now. I see chains falling off people. I see chains falling off people. Chains, things that have held you captive, they're falling off. They're falling off. Hallelujah. Zach, I don't know who this young man next to you is, but, man, there's chains falling off you, brother. They got the San Diego sweatshirt on. There's chains falling off you. You're not going to have addictions breaking off you. They're, and it's not to drugs. It's to other things. It's emotional things that have been holding on to you, bro. And God, is, they're falling off you like like. Like, eat, like like women's necklaces, those little chains, they're breaking so easy because you're surrendered. You are surrendered, dude. I like you. <laughs> you're surrendered, man. That's what God wants. He wants us to be surrendered. When we let it go, and give it, give it to God, who's right it is. You'll, some of y'all will walk out here never the same. I want it to be all of you. That word sincerity... It's not just simplicity, folks. It's sincerity. I've prayed this prayer before, Brother Mike. Nothing happened. You know why? You weren't sincere. You didn't mean it. You weren't done. You liked that golden calf too much. But see, some of y'all, you're almost nauseated. You saw today that golden calf is so ugly in the eyes of God. It's so hurtful to Jesus because you're choosing it over him. What did G, that calf ever, that, that golden calf ever do for you? It caused you pain. What has Jesus done for you? He gave it all on the cross. He died for you. Shed his own blood. Rose from the dead so he could walk with you. So you would never be alone. And we walk away from it to go back to that golden calf. I want you to see how that looks to God. It It stinks. Be done. Be done with this today. This is the last time this message is being preached. We're done. We're not, there's nothing in Egypt we want. Our hands are the plow and we're going forward. There's nothing back there. No one, nothing, no, no money, no job, nothing more important than Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. How many of y'all really believe that you let go of something today? Put your hand up. If you really believe that you let I see there's hands all over the place. I believe this was a moment in, in Kev, you did a great job. You plowed good this morning, son. You're never going to be the same after today. I believe when you leave today, when you break bread with the folks out there and eating your tacos, it's going to be a different scent in the house because the house, the house, and I'm talking about the majority of the house is surrendered. That's a good place to be. And when we get surrendered, that means our clay is pliable. Those those lumpy, dried places, those hard, dried clay in you. That's what he. That's what he took out. This just a few minutes ago. That's what he took out. Now you're pliable. Now he can mold you into something wonderful, a vessel of honor, meat for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. Now he can use you because. Your vase, your whatever this instrument he's making of you, it ain't got no lumps in it. 
Not no dry places. Not none of you or me in there. It's all him. It's him. Amen. Jesus, thank you for doing what you did today. Thank you, Lord, for... There's people that rededicated. There's people that made peace with you. There's people that... There's so many things that happen. I don't even want to label it all. There's so much you did today in moments. It only takes minutes when it's God. We thank you for that, Lord. We're never going to be the same after today. Our walks with you will be so much easier. Our burden will be light because we're yoked with you. Now I want you to confirm it. Turn around and hug somebody or shake somebody's hand and say, I'm different. Just do it right now. Confirm that God did something with you. Turn around and shake somebody's hand and say, I'm different. Never going to be the same. I'm different. I'm different. I'm different. I'm different. Hallelujah. With that being said, we're dismissed in Jesus' name. No. What are we doing? Y'all can sing the song <laughs> while we. This is while we all do this, you just sing. <laughs> They're gonna play the song. If you want to stick around and hear the seal, that seal it with the song. Truly, because the lyrics of this song is exactly what just happened. Okay. It's beautiful. You redeem the innocence that's stolen. You return the years I thought were taken. You're rebuilding every broken home inside my heart, and you made it all better. This is my Manasseh. You cause me to forget. Goodness washes over all the pain of my past. This is my Manasseh. You cause me to forgive. In all my broken places, you're rewriting what's been written. Thank you for Manasseh.
Take it from me. 